Um, we've been centering this work in, in uh, justice, inclusion, and respect um, because ACE is an international framework that really is very large, um, but there's some important considerations. Um, and, you know, as we've thought about, you know, the economic and racial and, and you know, historic injustices with indigenous and, and tribal communities, there's a lot of dimensions of, of this that we need to uh, work into this work. So, uh, you know, inequity, um, inclusion, and respect. So for perspectives and experiences and lived uh, realities of different people. So that's just something we wanna hold in as we do this work. Oops, what, too many. So today, we ha I have the great honor of having an awesome panel of leaders in the field who've been looking at, you know, where informal education and programs intersect. Um, so Bernadette woods Plackey from Climate Central, uh, speaking mostly about her work uh, with the Climate Central work. I'm an advisor on that from NOAA. Uh, David Sittenfeld, manager of forums and national collaborations from the Museum of Science in Boston will be with us today. Um, and uh, you have a range of things you could talk about, David, so full, full go where you need to. Um, uh, Rachel Valletta, hopefully, did I get that right, Rachel? Yes, you muted. did. I'm good enough. <laughs> I had to give the thumbs up. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, so environmental sciences at the Franklin Institute, my home institute in the Aztec community, since I'm a Philly boy. Um, so Miranda Massey, the director of the Climate Museum. Uh, for full transparency, I'm an advisor on, on that initiative. And then the round out the panel, we have Patrick Hamilton, the director of global change initiatives at the Center of Research and Collections for the Science Museum of Minnesota. So Patrick, uh, awesome to have you with us. So just some more context, just so we can get into the thing. So um, we have undertaken a ambitious initiative to launch uh, something that uh, is called ACE, an ACE National Strategy for the United States. No other major emitting in the country in the world has done this. Other countries have, but no major emitting country. And we feel that th this is an important initiative for us. It's also important that we do our part of the international collaborations on uh, addressing climate change under the Paris Agreement and under the treaty. It's both, not just the, the Paris Agreement, which we have signed you know, papers to remove ourselves. We'll see what happens in November. Um, that's not a political statements, it's just you know, reality. So, uh, but there's a process where you have initiation and planning and, and you know, we're really in the first two phases. So this, I've seen what we're doing today is part of planning. We're listening to what is robust in the community that relates to ACE, which is education, training, public access, public participation, public awareness, and international collaboration. I've extended that to national collaboration. So um, this is an undergoing process. We see this as a robust, a valuable thing that we've never done as a community before. So uh, we've been working on strategically about this for some time, but we really think that the ma next major phase of this is gonna happen in November, where we're gonna have a framework. We just completed last week, the dialogues for all the dimensions. Um, this conversation we're doing is just a deeper dive that we're doing once a month through the Clean Network. And uh, we'll be building out the writing already very valuable findings and conclusions are coming out of what we are discussing as a community. Um, there's, a, there's a very strong resonant finding, um, but we're gonna continue working that through into the written form and a review phase, and then hopefully have that to inform our actions going forward, depending on what happens in November, and then ultimately January. So, um, you know, there's a lot of steps to this process. Our community has been doing this. This is an international framework that the UN has, has sent to the world. Um, I'm your ACE reporting lead. So this is part of my purview as a, as a NOAA and a US government official. But you know, it's, we didn't follow this order. So we're viewing it a little bit out of order because um, we're trying to figure out what it means to do an ACE national strategy for a, a major emitting country. Again, no one's done this. So we're kind of making it up as we go. Um, in the dialogues, we had this process, and so um, you know we're we're at this this uh, you know pathway synthesis, and now we're moving to the framework. This what we're doing here in the Clean Network is kind of a parallel to this, still in the community phase, where we're just listening and listening and listening and listening. All of this is documented in the recording, so you don't have to worry about note taking. Although I know uh, Miranda, you brought somebody for note taking because it's there's richness that shows up in these conversations. 
The other ones are also available. So these will go into, whoops, these will go into the, to the writing process. They'll also go into, if we go to a full strategic plan, this is, we're only doing the framework now, we go to full strategic plan, that would happen um, next year. Um, these inputs are still very valuable and we're going to continue to collect them because there's so much richness and, and value in the community of what we've learned to inform what we could do together. So that I'm moving fast. I appreciate that. We're looking at a lot of different audiences. We've different thoughts in different places across the years. We've identified different ones. Uh, Rachel, you'll recognize a part of this diagram because it comes from the Climate Change Education Partnership Alliance audience framework uh, for effective practice. And then we expanded it because we saw key needs, including youth and workforce and, and community. Um, but you know, those are the dialogues that we, we just completed and uh, they're all available here. At least the launch is. The synthesis and the framework will be there, but the, the actual dialogues were recorded, but they won't be publicly available because we wanted to keep people that be can with candor and they were recorded for documenting uh, and writing, not for public use. Um, so the format of this listening. So I'm, I'm right on schedule. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm moving so fast, but it is recorded. Um, so the, um, we're really going to focus in on, on the panel discussion. It says questions for 10 minutes. We haven't done it yet. There's just too much to talk about. Um, so the questions will be coming in through the, the, the chat. Um, I, I'm the facilitator, we have the panelists, and then everyone else is gonna be in listening mode um, unless we actually get to questions. I don't see it, but we'll see. Um, so let's go for it. Uh, I just wanna frame what we're talking about here is that um, this is about where we have public education, uh, climate education programs. We've looked at other dimensions of how the informal education institutions have worked uh, related to ACE. Um, we, last, last time, last month, we looked at you know, community engagement, which is different. This is more about the public education programs. So based on my uh, knowledge, we kind of looked around and found some awesome leaders who are, are available to kind of talk about their work in this space. This is just a sample of all the rich and amazing work that is going on across our country, it's, but it's uneven. So just, just so we are centered in that. Um, so the first question, this is, I'm going to do this open. Um, any one of the panelists can speak at any, at any time. Whoops. Ah, I hate when that happens. Oh, oh, Apple magic mouse has got too much skill, <laughs> too many functions. So think about this. Why is informal, uh, community-based education key for supporting climate actions? We're running through a similar protocol. So these questions get a little bit wor wor you know, strange. But at the bottom, you know, we're talking about climate action. That's what communities across the country, we know it's extensive. It's uneven, but it's extensive. Um, but why is informal community-based education key for supporting climate action? Another way of saying that is, can you do climate action at a community scale without informal education? Either way, you can look at that question. But just, you know, and this is a picture from Climate Signs, which was a, pro a partnership with the Climate Museum. So I, I just love this idea of pushing these programs beyond the buildings out into the communities. It's just one, one insight of that. But open question. What do you guys think? Who wants to go first? I'm happy, to, I'm happy to go first. Um, go for it. Uh, just just in, in brief, I think every, everybody in the virtual room knows we need a really fundamental cultural shift in the direction of climate action, climate understanding, climate confidence, climate action. We also know from polling that the majority of adults in the US are freaked out but shut down on this. And informal community-based education gives people a sense that their action can join them with a meaningful community of action so that sense of being outscaled can start to soften and resolve. And you can have a spiral of collective efficacy and, and pro-social action on climate. And I don't, um, I think without community-based institutions doing this work informally in popular and trusted settings, um, we won't get that kind of buy-in beyond the absolutely necessary climate vanguard 
um, to which we are adjacent and uh, which we value deeply, but we need a broader community-based sense of effective action to take hold. And, and I think um, informal community-based climate education is critical to that. That's a great answer, Miranda. I love it. What else? Bernadette, um, uh, you guys, uh, you know, on the panel, if you just use hand signals, I got gallery views so I can see, you know, like, I got you, Bernadette. What you okay. got? I, I didn't know how to jump in. I, I, there there know, it is. I hand signals work. I never wanted to talk over someone. Um, so a, a couple of things here, just to get this going, because there's so many ways we can take this question. It's such a big one. Yep. It, first of all, it, it's a global issue, but you feel it locally and you feel it personally. That's where you do something. Now, your personal actions can build to global actions, but that's where things start. That's where you start to make those connections with what's going on around you and you actually do something about it. Um, so that's one part is that that local level, that personal level is really critical. Two, you know, we most people on this call are well aware of George Mason and Yale's research that they've done and the breakdown of six Americas and the trends and all of that. But the thing we've seen in that is that people are aware something's going on, but they're not exactly sure what and what to do about it. And the majority of people are there. It's just what, what is there? What does that mean? What do I do? And unless you can help them understand what that means, they don't know where to go with that. And then another thing is, this is such a massive issue. I mean, there are certain things that you can, when you change it, it changes. But with this, we all know this is going to take decades of sustained action to really stabilize our climate. So you need big policy changes, but you also need the public to understand where they fit in and what they can do. I mean, it's going to take all those different levels. So I think it's really critical for people to understand what's going on, where they live, what they can do about it. And that's where informal education really comes into play. I mean, People on this call are involved in formal education, but most of the world moves on from its formal education. And you have to connect with them where they are, where they're living and what they're doing. Right. Love it. Pat, David. Right. Sure, uh, well, go ahead, Pat. All right. Thank you, David. So just building on uh, Bernadette and, and uh, Miranda, science museums or museums in general are highly trusted sources of, of information and and in a highly polarized world that we live in, we're one of the few avenues that still caters to a broad range of, of audiences. We did a Six America survey of our visitors 10 years ago, and we found no significant difference between the people who visited the Science Museum and the national breakout of the American population across those Six Americas. So we have climate skeptics come to the Science Museum in addition to those who are alarmed about climate change. So we can, we can be that venue where the whole range of, of our publics can be exposed to the issue of, of climate change and be that bridge between the global issue and, and local action. Off to you, David. There you go, David. Thanks, Pat. I, I think... Um you know, the previous panelists have done a great job of talking about how informal education is an appropriate platform for this. So I think I'll, I'll shift to something slightly different, which is just that uh, there's the whole idea here that as a very interdisciplinary and complex and, and long range problem, as we heard from Bernadette, there's a need for people thinking about not only engineering decisions and the science that have to happen, but the values and the perspectives that underlie every single engineering decision that we make. Um, and uh, science centers and other informal science education institutions are really facile at trying to bridge the science with everything that's not the science in a welcoming and sort of like, you know, facile way that brings people together to say, okay, here's what we know, here's what we don't know, and here's what different kinds of uh, possible ideas and strategies for addressing these issues mean for different kinds of people. And so I think it, uh, their informal education is a really nice way of bringing together everybody that you're thinking about when we as individuals think about addressing climate problems, 
with everybody that we might not be thinking about. All the other ways that we have to bring in stakeholders that might not uh, sort of be the people that we see in our daily life, whoever we are, to think about all the people that are downstream of climate impacts and also the trade-offs around proposed climate solutions. What do we do in ways that can be equitable um, and sort of maximize the benefits of this opportunity in the way in the best ways that we can while minimizing negative impacts uh, for as many different kinds of people as we can possibly imagine. Awesome. Awesome. Rachel, you got anything more you want to build on that? Well, you know, just to synthesize um, everything that's been said already. I mean, we know about best practices in science communication and climate education in informal spaces. We know how to make climate data um, relatable. Um, we know how to make impacts understandable. And beyond that, we know how to connect to our surrounding communities. I think it's really about infusing those efforts now throughout different sectors and be able to reach those different, uh, many, many diverse communities that, that we are trying to scale up to through these efforts. And I think the creativity and the diversity among the programming that this um, panel represents um, is really an ideal um, example of all of the different ways that we can engage with all of these different publics where, where they're at, exactly as Bernadette mentioned. Uh, you know, I, I'm reflecting on, as I'm thinking about the panel and where you guys actually work between Philadelphia, St. Paul and Minneapolis, Boston, New York, and Bernadette, you, you're working media markets across the country, about 80% of the media markets across the country. You know, the, we'll, maybe we'll put a pin in it to talk about this. Make, let's make sure we talk about when you have robust climate action going on in your community, how does that relate to the work you're able to do in your institution and your programming with your publics? Maybe let's just go there now. It's a little bit out of order, but you know, because you're, you're the, the panelists are all working in markets, except for maybe you Bernadette, um, in places that are already rapidly taking on climate action. Um, whereas uh, other communities where they're not taking on climate action, doing this kind of robust programming might be more challenging. Any, any quick thoughts on that? Yeah, yes, we are. So for those who don't know, our model is we're working primarily with TV meteorologists, but we've expand, expanded our scope with journalists at large too. So really the media across the entire United States. We do work globally, but our primary focus is the United States. And it's, it's, it's a twofold audience because we do everything from workshops and trainings and straight through to produced content and data science analyses and, and visuals and just answering questions that people might have and how to translate something that they're seeing in their area into a story, you know, bring the story out in what's going on. So it's really a wide range. And the thing is, our audience is the public, but it's also these trusted messengers, the meteorologists and the journalists. And it's them finding their voice in their area where they live. Now, they wouldn't have their job if they weren't good at that already. So it's helping them pull that out from stories they're already doing and then inspiring more stories. So one of the things that we really focus on, and, and people say, oh, well, you know, is it harder here? Is it hard? We're finding people across the board doing this. I, I mean, it, it truly is everyone from the most conservative of areas where you wouldn't think the story was happening straight through to the, the more liberal climate action places that we're seeing. And it's, it's how they tell their story may vary, but they're telling their story. And, and that's where we work with pulling that information out of it because when, I mean, one of our great users, a primary example, because I'm kind of speaking all over the place right here, but Southwest Missouri, let's say, um, I think we're one of the few media organizations when we see that versus like a New York Times article, we get more excited because that's a place that's not necessarily having this conversation. And one of our meteorologists in Southwest Missouri, Elisa Rafa, who does a phenomenal job, it's, it's connecting with what people are seeing there. It brings it back to that local and that personal for her. So we try to bring concepts out at scale that can then be personalized for that person in Southwest Missouri and the things that matter to them most there. And so that's really the structure that we're working at. And we are seeing it happen in different voices, in different ways, but across the country and in, in places where we wouldn't think these conversations are happening, they're happening. And right. Lisa did just tell us recently, you know, going into her Walmart, a couple of farmers who had come up to her and said, thank you. 
because no one's talking about this here and we're seeing the changes. So thank you for making the connections for us. And sometimes it's that little simple connection that's really just missing and it helps build that concept of what they're seeing out there with the reality of what's going on. I appreciate that. Anybody else, this, this idea of like, you know, how climate action is working within the communities that you're focused on relative to uh, the programming that you're able to do? Actually, let me add one more thing real quick too, because it's not just location geography. We focus on that too, but it's the people within these places. And we do a lot with the Spanish speaking media. Also, we do all of our translation into Spanish. And it's a different conversation in the Hispanic community. And, mm. and it's, it's trying to tailor that conversation, again, through solid science and information. But even if it's in the same city where there may be an English speaking media, it's still a different conversation. So mm. it's working through different forms of communications through those places too. I mean, the golden rules everyone knows of communication is know your audience and then connect right. with them. Gotcha. Miranda. I think, I think, um, I mean, one huge advantage that we've had as a new startup museum for, for those on the Zoom who, who aren't familiar with us is that we've been able, because we're in New York City, um, to build relationships with a whole series of different kinds of very climate focused, climate centric organizations from tiny two person community arts organizations serving, uh, ser serving underserved youth in the South Bronx to New York City, which has had a fairly aggressive climate forward stance as, as I'm sure everybody knows. Um, so there's been a massive advantage in our location on that. But I also wanna say that even and I don't, of course, I don't say this in a spirit of pessimism at all, but just recognizing the challenge that we all face wherever we're operating, getting, getting people from being freaked out by the scale of the problem, by its distribution in time and space, as Rachel was highlighting, and silent and shut down, feeling outscaled, to even having a couple of conversations with the people in their lives they already know, trust, feel safe around, even that, every month, we get a new sense of how hard that is. So mm -hmm. I think there's a, a fundamental way in which that challenge supersedes the policies of um, climate forward versus not climate forward local governments and the kind of tribalism that we are, are, are now seeing in a really acute way across, across the country around is, issues that are wrongly polarized and politicized like climate. So I'm not sure about this and, and I'm sure there's some like, um, there, there's some innocence involved in operating in New York that we do have a lot of visitors out from out domestic tourists from outside of New York City in the tri-state area. But I, but I think there's a fundamental difficulty in taking that first step to be somebody who talks about climate and identifies that way um, and takes action even in New York. And yep. I wonder how different that is other places, frankly. Great point, uh, David. And then so, Pat. You know, uh, I think one of the things that we try to think about is a place in Boston where, as you point out, in some of the two cities that the museum actually physically is located in that I work, which are Boston and Cambridge, there are robust climate action plans, both on the resilient side and the mitigation side is we try to learn from those and think a little bit about um, what happens in the places that may just be a little bit not quite farther along in their planning. Um, you know, for every large metropolis where one of our cultural institutions may be located, um, you go maybe 20 or 25 minutes away, and there are any number of small towns that are grappling with resilience questions very similar, um, maybe on the same scale, but maybe a smaller one, but all of them have human dimensions built into them. And so we think really hard um, with respect to this question that you have up on the screen about scaling is to use what people in various communities um, in and around uh, our communities where we're actually actively working, but then other ones as inspirations to bring up these questions about different proposed strategies for building resilience or for mitigating um, our emissions and risks. And what does that mean to different kinds of people? And how can that be sort of laid out in different communities in ways that feels inclusive and authentic and connect with things that happen at the local scale? Um, I don't have all the answers for that, 
but they're important for us because we try not to just focus on our own backyard. We know that very hyper-local uh, education works in a lot of ways, but we feel that there's a lot of inspiration that comes from places uh, that many of you are working in and some places that none of us are working in um, where uh, people can take these kinds of issues and bring them uh, for conversations that might happen two or three years later but are just as important. Great point. Uh, Pat? I want to offer up an example of how uh, I think the Science Museum can help accelerate uh, change, and I hope that it'll be re relevant to other museums around the country. Here in the Upper Midwest, um, wind energy and now solar are cheaper than burning coal. We have crossed that threshold, and as a result, uh, coal-fired power plants are being uh, shut down very rapidly. In fact, the largest utility in Minnesota, Excel Energy, will be completely out of the business of burning coal by, by 2030. And as a result, our, they're accelerating their investments in solar. They're going to be investing $2 billion in solar and wind over the next five years as opposed to the next 10 years. And so we are just uh, starting to have a, a conversation with them about how the Science Museum's watershed research can help inform them about where solar goes on the landscape. So if we get not just clean energy, but clean water, carbon sequestration, and also uh, greater resilience to the extreme rainfalls that unfortunately are becoming increasingly common. That, that, that you're tapping into a, another dimension of the work, Pat, but a, a critical dimension um, intersecting with people, place, and, and decisions. So. Rachel, any, anything else you want to build on? And, and if you want to go into this question about, I mean, you know, because one of the challenges we have here is scale. Um, yeah. And I mean, David, you, you went there and I appreciate that. And it's kind of a prelude to this question. But, but you know, one of the things we know in our work over the last 15 years is that we've innovated a lot of really successful, we've learned a lot of really important lessons. But now taking what we've learned and then realizing that there's communities that aren't benefiting from this learning and these programs and these opportunities to support their communities. Um, and how do we do that um, without just continuing innovating, 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 um, mm -hmm. but actually scaling and replicating and partnering? I don't know if that right. segues into what you were thinking, Rachel. Thanks, Frank. Yeah, I, I think that there is a bridge. So much of what we just heard here is just about good message framing and how to connect with different audiences. But I'd like to, you know, bring up something that David was really pointing towards, and it's identifying community values. I think a lot about through our programming that we engage with people through the mediums and the social context that are already familiar with, that they seek, that they find enrichment through. And this has been a really essential first step for us in bringing diverse folks to the table. And I should specify, someone mentioned in the chat that we've been talking about museum education, but actually largely the, co the climate change education that we're doing is outside the museum walls. It's working through a large community of practice in the city of Philadelphia. So we work with nearly 100 or so organizations um, that are learning from one another. And I think that this gets to your question about scaling, Frank. I think that one model um, we can look towards and we should have a robust um, discussion about as this strategy is taking shape is the role specifically of the community of practice model. It's been uh, successful for us in connecting really disparate and otherwise disconnected voices. Um, and I think what it has enabled, another quote I'd like to pull from the last um, ACE discussion, it was by, by Curtis Bennett. Um, oh, yeah. You mentioned the importance of building transformational and not transactional relationships. I won't go into the importance of relationships. If you watched the previous ACE discussion, it was excellent. There was a lot of robust <laughs> discussion around the role of relationships, um, but it hasn't really come up yet um, in this particular talk. Um, but what Curtis said there really stuck with me and, and what it means um, really for me is about identifying in the context of identifying those those proper climate actions really forcing us to ask the questions what solutions work for us in our community instead of how can we make a solution work um, which i think is a is a departure from um, perhaps historically scientists approach um, to this question I love I love what Curtis had. He's bringing to the table these days. If you don't know Curtis's thoughts, uh, you know I'll I'll put the link to the the launch video um, with that panel. It's on the ACE website. It was it, it, there's some really good nuggets. But that's the whole point of this the process: just learning from each other. But that idea of relationships, really important piece. So it's not necessarily just scale, but it's the quality of scale 
Um, you know, it's not just about getting the numbers, and but also, Rachel, that idea of pushing beyond the walls into the community, um, but from the institution, as opposed to getting everybody to come through the door. Um, right, and, and recognizing that scale is only, um, only possible by, by forming those foundational relationships first and foremost. And that takes, you know, all of the resources that have, have again been enumerated on these calls, it takes that time and that money. And I suspect right. it'll come up again in our question around funding. So maybe I'll hit pause yeah. there. Yeah, so if, we're, if we can, sorry, I've been totally messing up the slides. Uh, you know, uh, now we're going to go to this question because <laughs> this is a really important one, which actually builds on something Curtis was getting at um, because it wasn't just transformational. It was also, you know, because the, the how our, our work in climate change education, empowerment, um, sports, but inclusive and equitable climate solutions because really Curtis was coming from that place um, in Baltimore. That's where he is with the National Aquarium. Um, but, it, but this idea of inclusive and equitable, um, that seems to be a critical piece of this uh, going forward. So any thoughts about this? I'm sorry, we're segueing, zigzagging a little bit today, but you know, any more thoughts about this, this dimension of it? Uh, David. Yeah, your virtual hand, your virtual hand gets like, you lose some fingers in that. <laughs> All right. um, so uh, I, I think it, it, others have talked about this in the chat or, or on earlier conversations, but I think sometimes it's important for us to consider how we frame the question, not in terms of what we're trying to get out of the conversation or where we're trying to go from a policy perspective, but what range of problems and considerations are people most looking to solve um, at, you know, in any given conversation. And even if the same two people had the same conversation 10 times, they might be coming at it from a different perspective some number of those times because of everything that's going on in their life and the world and, and all the things that many of us are going through right now as a society. And so I think a big part of this is actually trying to, I mean, do what you are sort of admirably doing here as a group um, uh, with ACE is to listen and get a sense of how this fits with, you know, the agendas that people are sort of, you know, trying to, the problems that people are trying to solve in their communities right now, and how mm -hmm. climate change is a part of that, to what respect is it a threat multiplier for people rather than being the main thing they're thinking of, to what respect is an opportunity to address other kinds of issues that um, are top of mind. Uh, no one's saying that climate change is not important. Uh, in this group, it is. But to talk about it without the context of everything else that's happening in the world and all of the cumulative harms that um, communities are facing in many ways, both because of everything that's happening in the world and sadly because of things that have happened to certain communities through, you know, just sort of systemic racism uh, and, and oppression. Uh, it's, I think it's really important not to do that in, in sort of a vacuum. Um, and so uh, I think that's part of the answer. The other thing I'll say very, very quickly is um, in terms of being equitable, I think it's really important to allow people to look at proposed solutions and have their own voice about what those solutions mean to them and what the dimensions of those solutions are from uh, you know, social, environmental, infrastructural, economic perspectives so that it's not a, do you like this or not? The world's not like that. And so we shouldn't be doing education that's like that. I appreciate that. Anybody else wanna build on this point? I'd like to follow if I can, Frank. Um, right. David's point is fantastic. And I actually think that there's a, a great need here for professional development, both within the informal um, space and outside. Um, and a personal anecdote um, around the, the challenges that David was mentioning there about which climate solutions, which climate actions are most appropriate, takes me back to one of my very first um, public events. I was uh, chatting with a community group that um, was working with a tree planting organization and a woman came up to me and asked me very, very bluntly, why should we plant trees here? That's when the white people move in. And in my inexperience and naivete, I was completely unprepared to field that question, to discuss with this woman what her experiences and expertise were that led her to pose that question, right? But she was absolutely right in that she was referencing the recent pattern of greening preceding gentrification in parts of our city and mm. predominantly in historically redlined neighborhoods. And I share that anecdote so that others uh, don't go in similarly um, in, in the dark here. What we're, what we're really um, 
talking about is having a reckoning with some of those institutional racist policies. And, you know, we're, we're sort of seeing this, I think, um, across the museum field, a desire to do this and across the, the science field writ large. But, but I wonder how this strategy can um, help further along that process and really demand that um, folks that are engaging in this work are, are, um, are capable, I think, of, of, um, of having those conversations. I agree. I appreciate that. Miranda, you want to build on that? I do want to build on that just to say, and I, I think um, th this has to do both with the authentic relationships that we build with community-based organizations in, in New York City, where we have a richness of climate and environmental justice organizations. And that's, that's not um, true in every, in every city in the United States, but there is a really strong infrastructure of climate and environmental justice CBOs across the country now. And I think those are critically important organizations to um, build partnerships with. Beyond that, just to say something I think everybody's thinking, but just to say it out loud, the coronavirus crisis has both exposed and intensified the excruciating um, racist and class inequality in our society. Um, then the murder of George Floyd and the mobilization for Black Lives protests coming out of that have, I think, put this question about equity and inclusion and real systemic change in that area of our life at the in the center of everyone's lane. It's no longer stepping out of your lane um, to address those issues in a really emphatic and focused way. And in fact, I would say that our work isn't pertinent if it's not, and this will take work and time and training and error, et cetera. But I think putting that um, question about a, a deep social transformation at the center of our thinking and work about climate and our programming is absolutely essential for it to be pertinent going forward. Not saying it wasn't essential before, but now in August, 2020, if we're still in August, I completely lost track. Um, we are. It, it's just not even, I just think it's, um, it, it, it can't not be at the center of our, of our focus anymore. Agreed. Pat, you want to build on that? Sure. Uh, I think that an example that comes to mind is the Minnesota Climate Adaptation Partnership. And I'm one of many members of that organization and every year organizes a, a conference about how we adapt in Minnesota to climate change. And all different parties self-organize to discuss climate change from their perspective. So I have found it particularly rich because every year I have a chance to sit in and hear farmers talk about climate change, the changes that they're experiencing some of the steps that they're trying to take to adapt to climate change. Same with Native American community, forestry community, urban areas. So I think the message there is that my museum and lots of museums across the country are, are embedding ourselves into, into organizations that are doing this cross-sectional work on climate. I appreciate that. So, so let, let's, let's, unless you've got any, Bernadette, do you have a point on here? Quick one. Um, yeah. I don't have all the answers. This is a really big and a really important question that you bring up and one that I think a lot of people are challenging themselves on how to do better. And they should be challenging themselves on how to do better on Absolutely. this. It's a long way to go. Um, but one thing I would really want to bring to the conversation, it, just one point is, unique collaborations because so often we go to what we're comfortable with in everything in life. And, and as, as a couple of people brought up, you know, stepping outside of our regular circles is critical, but also bringing those, those other circles into ours, how and when we can, I think is really important. When you can create collaborations that are rich and different and have different voices in how people look and the things that they're interested in from urban to rural, from black to white, from you know, east to west, to, to everything. I mean, there's so many different 
there's so many things about us that we fall into these pockets of who we are in our comfort zones. And this is a time to really push yourself out of that and, and not just listen to people because that's important, but bringing them into the conversation in ways that you can, I think is, is really, really critical right now. I, I couldn't agree more. I I, I'm reflecting on, on you know, Miranda, your point you made about like where we are in August of 2020. We wouldn't have had this conversation a year ago. This conversation has been moving. The 15 years I've been at this, this is a really new focus for us. And I think we're, 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 we're stepping into a place that is emerging. Um, a lot of this is emergent in the last, it's been coming, but it's not, it's, it's feels very different. So, you know, with that in mind, um, let's look at the needs because it's different and it feels like, especially given the, you know, the types of institutions we're talking with today and, and all the challenges they face with, with, uh, the economic impacts of the COVID, uh, pandemic in the, our country. But, you know, this, 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 this kind of, you, you know, burned it to your point about these types of relationships, these different relationships that are needed in order to do the work that we're talking about, you know, whether it's businesses, levels of government, NGOs, uh, you know, education groups, um, you know, providing coordination uh, across that or, or building those relationships because it takes work. It, this is not something that comes very quickly to support, you know, these education programs that are community focused, um, whether it's on education or empowerment. But those, what's needed in order for to, to really support those relationships being built um, as opposed to just the programming itself. David. So uh, I think there are two answers to your question, Frank, or at least two, there, there are lots sure. of answers. Um, one of them has to do with co-creation, right? Um, mm -hmm. I think for this really to connect in a way that is going to be, you know, helpful to all of the community-based groups that are working on this already, right? They, ha they have to see value in the extra sweat equity that comes with doing education around it instead of just the implementation that they're already doing in their work. And that means, I think, for everyone who is coming together to you know, do this kind of education, to think really carefully about how you can help to create collective impact in the work that you're doing, to not just get what you need to do to make a grant happen, um, and also to be able to participate when that you know, sort of day comes and there's not funding to support your work anymore. And that's a difficult thing that involves the board and, and institutional missions and all that for this being something that has to happen. There are some really, I think, exciting examples of that on the panel and also, uh, you know, institutions like the Wild Center that have basically just said, we're going to do this work. Um, it's important for the world that we do it and it's important for our mission. And so we're going to try to do our best to be a convener and make sure we understand where the value is for our partners. Um, and I think the second piece is the implementation, right? It can't just be the educator that is implementing it. Everyone has to implement it so that the different people know that their efforts are being shared with people that aren't just them and at, aren't at the same meetings. And that means collaborative agenda setting, collaborative decision making and education work, and then collaborative work for going out and creating action in the community. And that means that you have to think carefully about who's going to have what role and how everyone's going to be equitably sort of involved in the process, reimbursed for their time, but also um, is going to have a voice in sharing it to the com uh, communities that they are most connected to. So Bernadette, I think, is a wonderful example of somebody who is so good at reaching not only diverse publics, but also those professionals that she works with that have a special avenue to the public. And so the idea of thinking really carefully about how all these pieces come together um, and can sort of have a, an impact greater than their component parts is really important in the planning and the implementation. I got you. Others? Yeah, Miranda. Oh no, you, you're like supporting me. I, I like what I, I reaffirm what you said, but I don't have anything more to say. So, I mean, but let me dig into David, maybe it'll trigger something for the rest of you, but this is different than, is this the work you guys already do? I mean, Bernadette, this is kind of like the work you already do because you're a connector. You're building and supporting networks and stuff like that. But you know, if you're in an institution like Pat or Rachel or David, or even you, Miranda, um, that bridge building and, and building those relationships across those, you know, that's work. That's real work. And that, and if it's work, it's time and time is money. 
So, I mean, is that, is, uh, are you able to find the robustness to do this? Uh, or, is, or is finding the resource to support the relationship building and the, the network building and the collaborative structures, is that robust enough? Or is there, is there, are there needs? And really, this question is about needs. Um, or is there more need in that area than you currently have? I think this is where you're going with this, Frank. Um, Could be. A, <laughs> <laughs> you know, Rachel brought up communities of practice earlier. And this, so our whole program is based on collaborations in general. With, I mean, we started this with George Mason. You've been a part of this for so long, Frank. Noah, NASA, Yale, and AMS, and Wendy's on here too. I mean, there, there have been, but that's, that's one set when we started this. So who else can can be the voices that you want to add in. And so it comes back to that concept of trusted messengers and communities of practice. And so it's, it's figuring out these, these models that work and then identifying the trusted messengers within different areas. Like you said, business. I mean, we know Ed Maybeck does a lot of work with the health community. They are trusted messengers. The religious community and everything Catherine Hayho does. Um, we primarily, well, one of our major focuses is media, um, but it's thinking about those things that connect us across these avenues. For me, that's sports. I mean, sports is one of those things that brings people together. I sit at my Penn State games with people that do not think the same things I do politically at all. And the thing is, we need to focus on those things. And then how do you bring them in? So it's meeting people where they are, I think, in that what connects us first to try and bring those groups together and then take that community practice model and try to apply it. Um, something you had brought up a while ago, uh, in some conversation at some meeting, <laughs> right, that it stuck with me was how, you know, Starbucks is doing some great stuff on the sustainability front, but look at the audience they have that they are not connecting with. And so that's a bridge within its own organization that needs to happen. That's great that they're trying to save the coffee bean. It is so important. But also, how many people go through and get a cup that could have something on it that says something that could help move this forward? So there's bridges within structures themselves that I think sometimes need to advance. So, so again, it's, it's mm. not one answer. So I don't have a good, solid answer. But it's those building bridges and challenging yourself to do that, to identify either a trusted messenger within your own model, um, with, whether it's you guys are really based on this panel with me, you know, maybe find a sports star in your community who really does care about this. That gets to a lot more people in a different way and a different audience. So how can you break out into a new audience with a collaboration or with some unique grouping that you can put together in a specific project? Maybe not a long-term thing, but a one-off. You know, it's those are the ways I think you bring more people into this conversation. Um, food, water, we know these are things that we all care about. Tourism, once we can move again. Um, these kinds of things, you know, people identify with a certain place or it's, it's personal to them for some reason. And so how can you connect with someone from there and bring in the climate angle to it? So I, I'm kind of speaking in circle, circles, but it's, it, it's coming back to that building the bridges, forcing your group to think in new and different ways to bring in those different pieces that can get you in front of a new audience. I got you. Miranda. And, and I'm concerned that this might be too narrow a response to what I understand your question to be. No, no, it's okay. Go where you need to go. I, I think we, we try to focus as an organization for a whole variety of reasons on the social just, justice aspects of the climate crisis, racial justice, intergenerational justice, disability justice, on an international scale, gender justice. And we're working on some programs there specifically but I, I think it's really important to emphasize how much time it does take to build real relationships yep. with the communities of interest um, and the organizations that are leading those communities in doing that work. And that is, um, and it, it, I don't mean this as a gripe, but just as an agenda point for building awareness among funders, that comes across to funders as overhead, yep. the dread overhead line. And that is extraordinarily unhelpful in providing organizations like ours with the ability and to, to, to reach out and to build relationships that are true and authentic and not 
one off because we got a grant or for just a specific project or whatever. So I think our deepening our relevance going forward means acknowledging the, the significance of this relational work and time on its own terms. And um, I don't think from our perspective, that has not really started to happen in a significant way at all. And that's a serious problem. Uh, Miranda, you just named exactly what I'm, I'm, I'm seeing. I mean, the reason this question is here is because the, the power of, of these relationships, I mean, as, tra as Curtis said, transformational relationships, as opposed to transactional relationships, it takes time, but nobody funds them. Um, and that's, that's, you know, so the power of what, you know, Bernadette, you're talking about and David, what you, everyone's talking about is there. It's been demonstrated. That's why you're on this panel, by the way. Um, but at the same time, the, 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 the value of that reality is not been also turned in from the funders and the, you know, so it's, it's like, we'll take the value without actually making the investments to help, help that happen. Um, so that's extractional um, and not, you know, that's an inverted way of thinking about what Curtis was saying. So I, I'm right with you. So let, you know, I'm just gonna keep us moving on because here we are, <laughs> it's exactly the same place, right? It always gets here. Um, this is our Achilles heel. Um, you know, funding on this stuff is critically important. We were just talking about it. So I figured we'd just jump here, but this idea of increased versus reprioritized or prioritized, meaning that there are already investments out there and how do we reprogram the existing versus um, increase on top of that? I'm not saying you don't you want both, but um, how do we maximize, you know, either increased or prioritized funds to maximize, you know, uh, these programs effect? That's the short version of it. It's a critically important issue. How? How do we best increase? Like Rachel, to you got, you got something jump there? in there and not to add no? um, an asterisk to the length of this question, <laughs> um, but to, to bring it back to previous questions about diversity and inclusion. I think yeah. about this a lot and, yeah. you know, how are we, how, how can we possibly prioritize those institutions and those organizations that are doing DNI work well? And I think the simple, the simple and yet the impossible answer is we're, we're talking about a fundamental restructuring of funding here, right? We're talking about power redistribution. We have to ask these hard questions about who's actually being funded, who has the capability to manage and dispense um, funds. Um, what metrics do we use to initially assess institutional commitment to DNI? Um, how do we tier access for, for, to funding for organizations that are first entering this work versus those that are sustaining um, existing, um, existing relationships, existing relevance? Um, you know, we, we, we know in the informal space a lot, there's a plenty of research that shows that by POC led uh, organizations receive less funding than their white peer institutions. We know that um, those by POC leaders are seen as less trustworthy, less capable of, of managing and dispensing those funds. Um, and this is really getting down right to the foundational perception of, of who we think will do what with money. And I think we, we have to be willing to ask those really, really hard questions beginning with why do we, why do we think that way? So, you know, to, to perhaps go, come full circle to, to my previous response, I think we have to be willing to, to commit to that long, arduous, introspective journey here that's necessary to, to explore these and other related um, questions. And when I say we, I don't just mean educational um, institutions. We should be holding our partner organizations um, accountable to this as well. Um, we should be holding our funding uh, organizations accountable to this. I think about a, a local foundation in Philadelphia that is doing this work internally and now making it an extraordinary barrier to obtain funding for larger institutions to obtain funding to really, really um, explain their commitment to DNI work and right. going the extra step to um, essentially get, get uh, credit referrals, if you like, um, from the organizations that, that we claim to have worked with. And so I think this, this sort of thorough vetting is the only way um, to, to, or is one way perhaps to start on this uh, direction towards more uh, more inclusive um, programming, certainly. Uh, Rachel, I'm really happy this is recorded because um, there's so there's complexity and richness in what you just said that that are very structural and and important. So, uh, God, I'm I'm happy that this is recorded because there's some nuggets that I just can't remember if they flow by, but I can go back. So, any other points here about funding? 
We already I sort of talked about this. I, I David and then Miranda. Let's go, David and Miranda. There's a real opportunity to, I think, leverage the fact that communities are grappling with this on the ground and planning. So, um, you know, we, we haven't done so, or we haven't successfully done so, but we're increasingly thinking that rather than federal funding, which has been so helpful in creating resources for facilitating these conversations and using the resources of the federal government, what's needed now is like sort of state level funding that is in the same language of the people that are doing this planning at the towns. And some of them are climate people, but some of them are also like the local water manager who all of a sudden has found this sitting in their lap that now that they have to deal with this problem on top. And so if there's ways to sort of look there at bringing all this very high quality and in inspirational education that a lot of the people listening and, and talking have done and I'm inspired by to those local places in the language uh, of ways that actually allow a local water, water manager to participate rather than just, you know, sort of having to squeeze it into her schedule so that it can really do that. I, I think that there's real power and value in that and the people in the chat that were saying that this kind of work has been doing has been happening with coronavirus communication. I think that there's stuff to learn from the public health world about that, about how to do it on the, you know, using sort of national and global scale work um, at the local level in ways that can really lend relevance and importance and, and equity to the conversation. Great points. Miranda? Just super fast, um, appreciating your point, Rachel, about the um, funding being conditioned on real authentic work in this area. Uh, I, I've found it useful advocating with stakeholders um, that that growing trend. It's, it's just making the obvious point that it has to be coupled with a recognition of the time that will not result in an output of cultural widgets. <laughs> <laughs> so we need, we need, we need both, we need both and not just the requirement, but also funding for this work specifically. Fantastic. Uh, Brenda and Pat, we this, we're, we're kind on. of up against the wall here. So, um, okay, you know, to build on that one is, thank is you. Also continuing to fund programs at work. Everything doesn't yep. have to be a brand new idea because yep. sometimes things work. So let's, let's keep them going. <laughs> And, and the, the, the valley of death between works and, and finding the next one, the, the, the next thing, God, it's about, it's about 10 to 30 percent of people who make it across that chasm. That's a really bad uh, success rate. Um, so I'm right with you, Bernadette. Really important. Pat, any final points on this? Just an observation that I think that this uh, climate change challenge that we're facing is really a communications problem. And oftentimes we think of it as an infrastructure problem or a problem of physics. And the problem is, is that we just haven't reached a critical threshold of enough people being concerned enough about this issue to move it in the directions that, that we need. And so uh, I think that as institutions that are really heavily invested in, in communication, we often don't get the attention we deserve because the issue is perceived as being primarily in other areas. Uh, so Pat, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, that first question I asked you guys is, is can you envision informal education, I mean, climate action happening without the work that you guys are doing? Can you envision it being successful for the decades of work that we have before us without what we're talking about being deeply, richly involved? Can you envision it? It's a loaded question. I know the answer. Hasn't worked so far. Right, exactly. It hasn't worked so far. So why don't we try and start doing something different? Um, so uh, please stay engaged. Uh, there's a lot of rich information that we're doing in the framework to actually do to do to line this up. Um, so uh, if you want to join us in the listserv or if you want to uh, check it out on the framework uh, website. Um, but I really appreciate I know we're a minute over. Uh, I know there's more to be said. Uh, so, you know, the fun curve is definitely on the plateau side, not on the backside of this conversation. So um, we're going to have to wrap 